Dr. Charles Clements was brought up in a military family. He was a distinguished graduate of the Air Force Academy and was headed for an outstanding military career in the Air Force when his conscience caused him to stop flying the missions that he was engaged in over Vietnam. He left his plans to become a general and in time became a medical doctor. The concern for the third world that, he, that was awakened in him in Vietnam and his concern for United States involvement in the third world led him eventually to Central America. And 1982 found him climbing the hills of El Salvador, carrying a medical backpack, treating the peasants, and narrowly escaping death from bombs and bullets. Since he left El Salvador in 1983, Dr. Clements has published a book, Witness to War. He has spoken all over the country for human rights, testified before congressional committees, led congressional trips to Central America, and in 1986, he became the director of, the hu of human rights education for the Universal Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. A motion picture, an Academy Award motion picture based on his life and his work, Witness to War, has been shown in many parts of the country uh, and will be shown on cable television here uh, on all three of our local cable systems in Portland uh, sometime next week. We weren't able to get an exact time and date for that, but uh, watch your uh, TV host listings uh, if you're interested in that. It's a remarkable movie and worth, well worth watching, and that will be on our cable TV show uh, channel sometime during the next week. He has appeared frequently on many major television programs on all the networks, including the public broadcasting system, speaking uh, about his experiences and his concerns in this area. He will speak to us today on U.S. foreign policy in general in Central America and focus in particular on the issue of aid to the Nicaraguan Contras. Please welcome Dr. Charles Clements. It's my honor to be here today. And I've entitled my speech, Nicaragua, Another Vietnam or Another Rhodesia because we stand at a critical turning point in foreign policy. <clears throat> Whether the historical metaphor for Nicaragua will be Vietnam or Rhodesia is going to be determined in the coming months. Congress and the American people have spoken. They prefer the Rhodesian model. The administration remains silent, but it is no secret that they prefer a Vietnam-style model. Without a sense of history, neither analogy will make sense. Rhodesia represented a bitter 15-year civil war. It was literally black versus white, Marxist versus capitalist, haves versus have-nots. There were death squads as brutal as those in El Salvador. And yet in the end, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe by ballots and not by bullets. Like Nicaragua, the conflict there was portrayed as a communist threat to the regional security of southern Africa. It's important to understand why it was solved by negotiation. This almost unknown and little remembered triumph of diplomacy was only possible because the regional superpower, Great Britain, understood the Civil War was an expression of revolutionary nationalism rather than an expression of the East-West conflict. Today, Zimbabwe, as Rhodesia is now called, is one of the more stable and prosperous countries in the region. It receives foreign assistance from the United States. White farmers who fled to South Africa are moving back, acknowledging that their place in society and property has been respected. Even more unusual for that part of the world, Zimbabwe is a net exporter of food. Last week at the Air War College, I met a student from the Zimbabwean Air Force. Imagine the United States training general officers from a Marxist state. For Zimbabwe, stability is a shield behind which development is taking place. We have us today, before us today, the option of a Zimbabwe-style solution to the war in Nicaragua, a conflict which many view as an expression of revolutionary nationalism. The Contadora process and the Arias peace plan are both predicated 
on this interpretation of history. The nations of the region most like ourselves, capitalist and democratic, view their neighbor's conflict in this manner, not as an expression of the East-West conflict, but as an expression of Nicaraguan nationalism. However, another worldview sees that the war in Nicaragua is an expression of the East-West conflict, which threatens U.S. security. This is a worldview that has been resurrected from the 1950s, which ascribes all revolutionary impulses in the third world to the Soviet Union. And it was this worldview which led us step by step into Vietnam. It was this worldview which has led us step by step into deeper intervention in Nicaragua. It has been the dominant foreign policy rationale of the post-World War II era of U.S. interventionism. The historical landscape is littered with the wreckage of that policy, of which Indochina is the best known. Many Americans don't remember that it was the United States which overthrew the first parliamentary style government of Iran in 1953 and restored the Shah, leading eventually to revolutionary fanatics more brutal than his own despised secret police, the Savak, because we reviewed the socialist parliament as a threat to our security. Many Americans forget or didn't know that the United States overthrew a democratically elected government in Guatemala in 1954, which led to 35 years of human rights nightmares under military juntas. Many Americans forget the American role in the military coup in Chile in 1973, toppling yet another democratically elected government with some of the same hopes of Nicaragua or Zimbabwe. But the economic failure of General Pinochet's military dictatorship is now something we're trying to end as we did Duvalier's and Marcos's reigns of greed. Pursuing the Vietnam option for Nicaragua means seeking a military solution. It means applying the dominant lesson of the Vietnam War. But before I speak of that, let me say that one thing that has allowed this nation a measure of greatness is that since our founding, we have remained on a self-correcting course. We've not always had a monopoly on wisdom or goodness, but we have slowly and sometimes painfully been able to recognize our errors, learn from them in most cases, and steer the ship of state on a proper course. As I've said, sometimes slowly, too slowly for many Americans, as it must have been excruciating to be a woman, not be allowed to vote until the turn of the century, or how much more so a black and not be able to vote until barely 25 years ago, the ship of state is not fully on course, as literally hundreds of voter registration suits are being filed today in southern states on behalf of black voters who are still disenfranchised. But we remain a nation on a self-correcting course. It has been more difficult in foreign policy. And as a Vietnam veteran, it's my feeling that we have not come face to face with that conflict or learned its painful lessons. The official lesson of Vietnam is not that the American military was asked to carry out tasks which could not be performed, given the corrupt and brutal nature of the government the U.S. was aiding, the risk of widening the war, and the failure of two presidents to make the case that defeating communism in Vietnam was worth tens of thousands of American lives. The reason South Vietnam and America did not win the war has more to do with conceptual failures and misconceived mission but instead it is blamed on the media and peace movement's paralyzing effect on our will to win. The lessons of Vietnam don't include the fact that the dominoes didn't topple, that despite 30 years of promises that all Southeast Asia would go communist, we would have to meet them at the Golden Gate Bridge. Harley holds up to an ASEAN today of robust economies in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and Taiwan with whom Vietnam is begging to trade. The only devastated countries remained those into which we carried the war, Laos and Cambodia secretly, and then not so secretly. But those are not the dominant lessons of Vietnam. The dominant lesson of Vietnam that is being applied today in Central America is called low intensity conflict. As a physician working in an area of 10,000 civilians in El Salvador, which was declared a free fire zone, I can assure you there's nothing low intensity about napalm or about Gatling guns which put a bullet in every square foot of a football field every 60 seconds. 
No, the low intensity misnomer is meant for the American public. It's meant to guarantee low intensity opposition. Put most simply, the lesson of Vietnam was that America does not tolerate her sons coming home in body bags. So today, we, the United States, will provide the training, we will provide the logistics, we will provide the arms, we will provide the intelligence gathering, we will provide the command and control, that is, we will give the orders, but they have to provide the dying. That is the reality of low intensity warfare, as it is being called around the globe. The strategy of intervention which has been resurrected worldwide is both damaging to U.S. security and credibility if the objectives are neither realizable nor clear. The result is often a loss of prestige and influence if the latest efforts to modernize our strategy are no clearer view of what revolutionary nationalism is and what it is becoming than reflected in the Pentagon Papers of the Vietnam era. The reality as the Soviets are painfully discovering in Afghanistan, is that military solutions do not come easily in the struggles for freedom and independence that characterize our time. For uncertain objectives in underdeveloped countries, the United States is sacrificing a crucial objective, the commitment to development. The bipartisan Kissinger Commission itself recognized that poverty and inability to bring about change, not the Soviet Union, were the primary causes of turmoil in Central America. It recommended that we build a multi-billion dollar shield behind which development would take place. But any one of you who have been in the midst of war can testify that war is not a shield behind which development takes place. How many businessmen and women in this room would invest in a war-torn economy? Peace is the shield behind which development can take place. And we have put billions into that military shield in El Salvador, i.e. making it into a war, and has devastated the economy, exacerbating the very causes of the turmoil. Two and a half billion dollars later in El Salvador and 60,000 lives, the unemployment rate has climbed from 21 to 33 percent, the structural unemployment closer to 50 percent, the illiteracy rate has climbed from 43 to 51 percent, the households with no drinking water have climbed from 56 to 81 percent. And I promise you that when the Congress is going to be asked for another two million a day next year with no end in sight, it will seem like the black hole of Calcutta in which we pour billions as it looms as a major foreign policy crisis. There have been no development in El Salvador and the causes that brought about this turmoil have only been exacerbated. But the strategy for conducting low-intensity conflict strikes at the very heart of the development process. The readiness to conduct low-intensity war to prevent models of development that the U.S. opposes for ideological reasons sends a clear message. We prefer no development to what we consider the wrong path to development. When countries with revolutionary governments find themselves at war with the U.S., of course they become poor as has Nicaragua. If we look at examples, however, like Ethiopia or Guatemala, it's clear that neither the left nor the right has any ready answers to development. But what is dangerous is that the countries surrounding U.S. intervention become poor too. It's impossible to tear down Nicaragua and build up Honduras and Costa Rica at the same time. All three nations are part of the same regional economy. They understand the war will regionalize and in effect we have carried the war there already with our secret bases built without congressional approval. In Nicaragua, the primary targets of the Contras have been education, agriculture, and health care. School teachers, physicians, nurses, and health promoters, as well as agricultural technicians, many of them from abroad, persons like Ben Linder, have been the purposeful target of the Contras. America flexes her muscle in Nicaragua by having its proxy mercenary force kill school teachers, doctors, and farmers. It may come as a surprise to people outside of Portland, but Ben Linder's tragic death was not an aberration. The institution for which I work, the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, which has been leading congressional delegations to the region for some 10 years, has just published a booklet called Health as a Human Right. 
It thoroughly documents contra attacks and even torture and mutilation of health workers and the destruction of medical clinics as a purposeful tactic, a tactic which violates the Geneva Conventions that guarantee the medical neutrality of personnel and institutions even in the midst of conflict. And though not lot widely reported in the U.S. press, these practices of the Contras have been widely reported in the most prestigious medical journals and literature, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Journal of the American Public Health Association, and the American Journal of Nursing. Why is there no outrage? Generally, when governments engage in morally repugnant acts, there are attempts at denial or cover-up. But the Office of Public Diplomacy for Latin America has not even denied the allegations. And in fact, on leading congressional delegations, I've had the Contra's Human Rights Office in Honduras admit to these practices, excusing them by saying that the Sandinistas build clinics next to military facilities, which is not true upon examination either. But I focus on this point about the strategy of low intensity warfare striking at the very heart of development, the causes of these kinds of conflicts because it violates the very precepts by which Americans wish to live. And I think that's why the vote in Congress last week finally said no more aid to the Contras. According to Sam Sarkeesian, one of the leading theorists and national experts on low-intensity conflict, a consultant to the Department of State and Department of Defense, quote, national leaders and the public must understand that low-intensity conflicts don't conform to democratic notions of strategy and tactics. Revolution and counter-revolution develop their own morality and ethics that justify any means to achieve success. Thus, we become that which we wish to destroy, claiming that the ends justify the means. It's not a new theory, low-intensity conflict. We just don't want our boys dying in the application of it. We called it counterinsurgency in Vietnam. It didn't work any better there than it's working for the Soviets in Afghanistan. Once again, the official worldview has been resurrected in which a variety of indigenous nationalist movements are simply stipulated to be creations of Moscow. And certainly Moscow is not unwilling to use them to embarrass the United States. But such a worldview requires, as the Reagan doctrine has engaged, a belief in something like a revolutionary international, a belief that guerrillas constitute one great global army of the disaffected out to get the United States. The lessons of Vietnam, of Iran, of Guatemala, of Chile, of Nicaragua, and of El Salvador don't provide evidence to support that view. The grievances that drive men and women to desperate political acts grow out of specific political and sometimes religious grievances homegrown on particular pieces of real estate. The peasants with whom I lived in El Salvador who, because they sought land reform, organized unions, created cooperatives, and finally, when each of those attempts at change were violently crushed, turned to armed struggle, are labeled terrorists, subversives, and communists. But the vast majority of them wouldn't know the difference between Marx, Groucho, or Karl. They're responding to their own reality. As one peasant who was puzzled by a Quaker being in the midst of war, he said, you gringos have strange conceptions of violence. You're worried about violence done with a machine gun or a machete, but what about the violence to the spirit? He said, I used to work on the hacienda and would feed the dogs bowls of meat or milk before I went to the fields, but I couldn't put that food on the table for my own children. I used to take the dogs to the veterinarian when they were ill, but my own children died without medical care when they became sick. He cautioned, if you do not comprehend the violence to the spirit, which comes from slowly watching your children die of malnutrition, you will never understand violence or nonviolence. I would ask you to compare the words of this peasant in El Salvador in the 1980s to his top secret State Department document written 40 years ago by the architect of our Cold War foreign policy, George Kennan. George Kennan said, we have 50% of the world's wealth and 6.3 of its population. In order to maintain this disparity without detriment to our national security, we must dispense with sentimentality and daydreaming. 
we can no longer afford the luxury of altruism and world benefaction. We must cease to think about vague and unrealistic notions such as the raising of living standards, human rights, and democratization. Those chilling words were the document that led us directly into Vietnam. He was talking about Southeast Asia, where our concern for the next 30 years had little to do with the raising of living standards, human rights, and democratization. Why is this choice between the Rhodesia-Zimbabwe model and the Vietnam model of action for Nicaragua important? We can, after all, triumph militarily in Nicaragua. It's a tiny country with two and a half million people and almost no resources. With enough weapons, mercenaries, and in the end, maybe U.S. troops, we can achieve a military victory. We could have in Vietnam as well. But what is the price to them, to us, to the region. By this time tomorrow, 40,000 children in the third world will have died of malnutrition-related causes. One three sixty-fifth of the 17 million children that UNICEF estimates die annually of easily preventable causes. And around the world, parents will grovel in the dirt day after day to try to provide their children with an adequate diet. And when the violence to their spirit becomes so great, when their existence has so little dignity that their lives have no more meaning than their deaths, they may in desperation pick up a rifle and fire at a multi-million dollar jet. And if we continue to scratch our heads and ask where they get the rifles as we supply the jets, rather than understanding the desperation that led to such an act, then we may remain the 911 for repressive regimes that cry communism when their privilege or position is threatened, whether in Central America South Africa, or the Philippines. The example of Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and as well before that, China gives us choices that do not exist in the black and white world of the Vietnam model, of the Reagan doctrine. The resources of the earth and the ingenuity of humanity can provide abundance for all, as long as we're prepared to recognize the diversity of humankind and the variety of ways that people will seek national fulfillment. The costs for the other options are high. They are not only monetary, though we have doubled our entire national indebtedness. What it took 205 years to accumulate in debts from 1776 to 1981, a trillion dollars, we have managed to double to two trillion dollars in six short years, throwing most of it at this elusive concept of national security. Iran Contragate, though, shows even more alarming cost. CIA Director William Casey proposed a, quote, off-the-shelf, self-sustaining, standalone entity which could perform covert political and military operations without accountability, like trading arms to terrorists or cooperating with drug kings in Colombia to fund the Contras. As Senator Warren Rudman, the Republican for New Hampshire, said, if you carry this to its logical extreme, you don't have democracy anymore. And that is a higher cost that we must recognize. In recent years, the American government has split in two. In foreign affairs, it acts as a secretive, fitfully accountable state run by a national security elite, while in domestic affairs, it functions reasonably well as a democratic republic. After almost 50 years of Cold War, this compartmentalization has almost been an accepted political reality. But the notion that the domestic and foreign branches of government can operate with radically different rules and values is corrosive. The arguments for limiting or suspending democracy in foreign affairs can be extended to domestic affairs, especially when it becomes hard to tell where foreign affairs leave off and domestic affairs begin. A recent experience with domestic surveillance and harassment by the FBI are just beginning to surface as those who try to change the course of this foreign policy were labeled threats to our national security. The democratic experience of the U.S. has exerted enormous influence in the world, enormous positive influence in the world. For 150 years, observers of America from Alexis de Tocqueville to George Kennan have wondered aloud whether this nation can survive as a great power in the swamp of international relations and still remain a democracy. The tension between projecting power abroad and maintaining liberty at home 
is particularly sharp when military power is committed for purposes which either the American people do not understand or support. Low intensity conflict is a lesson of Vietnam, a strategy for fighting wars without popular support. And if, as Caspar Weinberger said, low intensity conflict presents the most immediate threat to free world security for the rest of this century, then the choices that face us in Nicaragua are critical in deciding whether America will be forced to confess that democracy does not work when national security is at risk. Reconciling national security with the requirements of democracy poses the greatest challenge to the idea of popular government since this great nation was founded. Let us not have this reconciliation take place behind closed doors. For me, one of the lowest moments of American history occurred this summer when Robert McFarland's testimony before the Iran-Contra hearings led him to explain why he was afraid to tell the president his policy of covert aid to the Contras was doomed. Why, in other words, he was afraid to tell the president that thousands of lives and millions of dollars would be spent to no avail. He said, quote, we didn't choose the right instrument to do it. Succinctly put, where I went wrong was not having the guts to stand up and tell the president that. Robert McFarlane was then asked why. To tell you the truth, probably the reason I didn't is because if I'd done that, Bill Casey, Gene Kirkpatrick, or Cap Weinberger would have said I was some kind of commie, you know? Some kind of commie, a name he feared being called and so it truncated debate. At this critical juncture, what the choice is before us of ending the third war in modern history, by negotiation. Korea ended in stalemate, which led to negotiation. Rhodesia became Zimbabwe in the end by a negotiated settlement. And Nicaragua could be the third step for humankind in this direction. It is critical to recall that defenders of democracy are those that believe that wisdom can come from the clash of contending views and the passion and expression of deeply held beliefs. And let us remember that the seminal spirit of American democracy does not reside in stifling of debate, the condemnation of dissent, or the attempts to intimidate rather than reason that have characterized this administration. Let us remember those who have kept this nation on a self-correcting course have done so because the sharpest criticism often goes hand in hand with the deepest idealism and love of country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clements. Thank you, Dr. Clements. Uh, the microphone is being set up out there. Uh, you're welcome to approach it with your questions. Karen and Mark will circulate to gather your written questions, if you have any. Our first question is from our board host today, Bill Franck, a member of the Board of Governors and chairman of our membership committee. Dr. Clements, uh, during the recent debate on additional contra aid, the Reagan administration took the position that the previous contra aid uh, is what has brought the Sandinista government to the peace table. Uh, if you believe that was not a factor, uh, what has brought Daniel Ortega to the peace table? And if the area's plan is finally consummated, do you think the Sandinista government uh, will abide by the terms of the arrangement? And if you do, what gives you confidence that they will? I think that it's important to recognize that the Contras as a military force didn't bring about uh, any concessions, uh, so to speak, uh, until there was the framework of the Contador plan and the Arias peace plan. And in fact, as early as 1982, uh, the Sandinistas have been willing to negotiate, and the record shows that they have uh, attempted to do so, the issues of concern of our national security. <coughs> Those concerns uh, have been put forward in draft treaties accepted by the Contador nations, as well as the nations of Central America, as early as 1984, that guaranteed no foreign bases on Nicaraguan soil. All advisors would be sent home. 
arms would be limited in accordance with a, a formula uh, developed by the Central American nations and that Nicaragua would allow cross-border inspections by international teams to ensure that no revolution was being exported to other countries. But the security that they insisted on for those concessions were that the United States stop, stop supplying the Contras. And the United States has consistently rejected negotiation as a option in Central America because the interpretation of this administration that it sends a blink to the Soviet Union. Uh, that was documented in a National Security Council document that was leaked, a top secret document, on October 25th, 1984, that boasted we had effectively blocked the Contador draft treaty. It was further uh, evidenced by Ailet Abrams' statement in the midst of the Contra debate in June of 1986 that it didn't matter what the Sandinista signed, that we would not uh, we would not uh, uh, stop supplying the Contras. I think what we have to ask is, uh, how does this look from the Sandinista viewpoint? Uh, they have come to power expecting the United States to overthrow them, as they knew that we did governments with similar goals that were democratically elected in Guatemala or Chile uh, in the 50s or 70s. And what incentive do they have to uh, comply with a the treaty? They have... Uh, made formal obligations to the nations of Latin America that make up 90% of the debt and 80% of the population, the Contador group and its support nations. They have made those same uh, promises to their neighbors, uh, the four Central American republics under the Arias plan, and they have publicly made those commitments uh, in writing to the President of the United States, who has consistently refused to, to meet with them. I think that it is natural from the viewpoint of the, of the Sandinistas who have seen this covert policy carried out despite the Congress cutting off aid, uh, despite numerous concessions made on their part under the draft treaty, that the United States has never indicated a willingness to, to stop funding the Contras, as this last uh, vote indicated. Despite uh, uh, the characterization of it as humanitarian aid, it contained more military aid for the period involved uh, than previous appropriations. Uh, it contained uh, aid that would clearly not uh, meet any international definition of humanitarian aid, that is, uh, supervised by an international agency of uh, the type of medicine, food, and, and, and clothing. So I think that uh, what we have is that uh, the Sandinistas would be internationally isolated, would be illegally isolated, and would have, uh, I think, the, the moral force of the, uh, of the American Congress to deal with if they violated those treaties. Uh, in fact, they would be committing suicide to do so uh, because they know that there is no uh, great margin of support uh, to look for a negotiated settlement to this conflict. My name is Dave Jones, and I'm a member of the club, and I'd like to ask about the role of Panama. Revelations about General Noriega are coming out. The U.S. Senate is holding hearings, and uh, the whole thing is taking a new complexion. Would you like to comment on this, and also, would you like to make an educated guess on how long General Noriega will survive, days, weeks, or months? Well, those are all very complicated uh, uh, issues to address accurately. I would like to say that we have known about General Noriega's drug dealing for some time. He was one of the main sponsors of the Contras who were shipping cocaine into this country from at least two sources of which we were aware. Uh, flights filled with marijuana landed in, uh, in Florida at uh, Air Force bases and were allowed to go through with the, with the knowledge of U.S. officials. Uh, and we've had a very hard time bringing this evidence to the fore. What puzzles me is why at the moment. Uh, is it because Jose Blandon is, w is wanting to run for the Panamanian presidency? Uh, what has caused this sudden attention? The CIA has been cooperating very, very thoroughly with Noriega for some time, and it's been open knowledge of his dealing in drugs with the Honduran military, uh, with uh, uh, other military officials throughout the region. He has played both sides against the middle. He has acted as a friend of the Sandinistas. At the same time, he has uh, helped the United States uh, effort at times in, in destabilizing them. 
He has done the same thing to uh, uh, Fidel Castro, giving him intelligence information at the same time feeding intelligence on Cuba uh, to the CIA. And I think uh, the question that puzzles me is why uh, the United States has chosen to, to end this cozy relationship at this moment. Is it because the indictments were going to expose the CIA and embarrass this administration? Uh, or is it because of Jose Blandon's determination to run for the presidency? Uh, it's, it's a curious thing that this thing that those of us who follow the issues have known about for some time is becoming a, into the public realm. Uh, we have had plans, of course, to, to ease Noriega out of office. And one of those was, uh, was interrupted by uh, uh, an aide to, to uh, Vice President Bush, who may have hinted that if Vice President Bush got elected president, Noriega wouldn't have to step aside. And so um, it's a very complex situation. And Noriega is very firmly entrenched. And I don't know how long uh, he can stay in power. It depends on how long the Panamanian military, uh, who are quite closely connected with his illegal activities, um, if the United States gives them a signal that they will be forgiven if they eject Noriega, that may very well happen. If they feel that they will be dragged down with him in some kind of Argentine-style scenario where they're held responsible for the crimes they've committed, then Noriega will be in power for a long time. Did Bush make the phone call? Uh, hard to say. I really, I really, uh, I really don't know. You certainly can't, uh, can't believe much of what you uh, hear these days coming out of Washington, D.C. We find that deniability means that you, you can deny anything and, and, and provide a rationale for not having done it, and we find out later that much of it has taken place. Tell us about Daniel Ortega. What kind of man is he? How much of a communist is he? And about your visit with him and a sheriff congressman. Uh, President Ortega of the directorate of Nicaragua is one who is viewed as a moderate and who has consolidated his power. I would suggest that if a negotiated settlement is brought about, that power will be enhanced. And if the war continues, uh, he will be overshadowed by the, by the hardliners. It's important to understand that except for Thomas Borges, the, the, the elder statesman of the, of the directorate in Nicaragua, these are all young men. Daniel Ortega was an altar boy till he was 14. He was in jail for the next seven years and in the mountains for the next seven years, and then he was head of state. Uh, they were brash when they came to office. They were arrogant. They were, they were proud. They, they made mistakes and statements that reflected they didn't understand the subtleties of statecraft. But I think that the one thing you'll find running through the history of their leadership is pragmatism. And the Soviet Union has been very critical of them, of allowing seven political parties to operate, of not controlling all the means of communication in the, uh, in the country, of not having a state-controlled economy because 60 to 70 percent of the economy remains in private hands. Um, and Daniel Ortega is one of the architects of that pragmatism. I think that they, uh, if they uh, would be called Marxist, one would have to look at them as kind of a, a homegrown Marxist in the sense that they are trying to forge for Nicaragua what is a new way. And it's interesting to hear them talk about Cuba and what a basket case it, that is and that they don't want to end up in a position like Cuba. They would like to uh, balance their dependence, as they put it, and they tried very rapidly to, to diversify their dependence to, I think they get about 20%, 6% of their aid from the Soviet Union, about 22% from the economic community of Europe, 18% from other third world nations, and at one time they were getting, uh, until 1985, the embargo, about 21% from the United States. But there is no doubt about it that that society has been in the midst of war, and they have done things that have been unpopular with Nicaraguans and would be unpopular here at home. Uh, they've uh, rounded up citizens and put them in camps. They've restricted freedom of the press. They've limited First Amendment civil liberties. Uh, they have uh, done things which nations do when they resort uh, to national security as a defense all of those things which the United States did in the midst of World War II. I think what's remarkable is taking congressmen to meet with uh, Daniel Ortega and seeing the exchange that takes place, which is uh, over the years uh, changed to, to, to one of, of, of openness and I think to one of a, of a skilled negotiator. 
Uh, at one time, the question is referring to a congressman, Tommy Robinson from Arkansas, a former sheriff who was there. and He said to uh, Daniel Ortega, he said, Mr. Ortega, uh, why do you wear fatigues? He said, you remind me of Fidel Castro. And it was said in a very, very negative manner. And, and uh, President Ortega's response was uh, that it, it doesn't matter what I wear. I've become a symbol. If I wore a three-piece suit, you'd say I remind you of Gorbachev. And it's interesting to see the head of state visit with congressmen and see them insult him on a regular basis. And I don't think our, our president would tolerate that. Uh, and respond to them and try to answer and to try to explain. And I think that... Uh, um, that he has been uh, uh, portrayed uh, as the architect of what's going on there. I think he's the architect of much of the pragmatism. I don't think he's the, uh, uh, the hardliner that some of the other members of the directorate are. Bill Weber, City Club member. For the past 20 years, I've had quite a bit of contact and visited many times the country of Costa Rica and have observed what's been going on in Central America from a uh, close viewpoint, shall we say, and I uh, heartily support uh, your contentions. And let's say now uh, we're reaching a point uh, in our country in, uh, as far as the people are concerned, in being against uh, additional military aid to the countries Approaching the point that we were in Vietnam several years ago, where at that time, the uh, government seemed to realize uh, the attitude of the American people. So let's say now that the attitude of the American people are being heard more so, but there are obvious uh, uh, forces that uh, prevent the government from changing their attitude. And those forces may be political, it may be uh, internal professionalism in the State Department. Could you identify those forces from the standpoint of, uh, is there a likelihood that our government might change their attitude? I sp by government now, I mean the administration. Well, I think that it's a, it's a very good question because I think that, for instance, with regard to El Salvador, even if a democratic administration were elected, and the president, as many of, of the Democratic candidates do, feel that our policy there is failing badly and uh, on a disaster course, it would be very, very hard to change that policy uh, in any short period of time because of the momentum it has, because of the forces at, at, at work there. I think they're complex. I think they include the defense, uh, military defense establishment itself. I think that it includes uh, operations like uh, we saw exposed with Iran Contra Gate, with uh, uh, a shadow government that has been operating covert operations since the Vietnam War, uh, largely with uh, funds generated from drug traffic in Southeast Asia and places like uh, places like uh, Colombia, and that's the uh, General Secords operation and uh, uh, that which is being addressed by the Christic Institute's uh, lawsuit. I think a lot of it is an attitude uh, that is entrenched, and we've seen, I think, a bleeding of the State Department, much like we did in the 1950s when all the China hands who knew anything about that country uh, were purged or uh, harassed to the point where they left the State Department, so we're left with a number of people who are hardliners, and those who, who dared to dissent know they do so at risk of losing their careers or promotions and finally decide they would like to go someplace else. And I think that it's an extraordinary power of this president to communicate and to have people want to believe him, uh, to paint a simplistic picture of black and white that belies the complexity of this world and his unwillingness to, uh, to give up that at, uh, at times. I think that uh, probably the concessions made to the Soviet Union and the INF Treaty will cause him to have to stand taller on Central American issues. Uh, and we predicted that when the INF Treaty was signed, it was going to make it difficult to reach an accommodation in Central America because of the pressure from the conservative wing of the, of the Republican Party. So I think that those are some of the factors that make it difficult. But I think there's great reason as well to be hopeful. The CIA agent, uh, as I mentioned, who overthrew the Guatemalan government in 1954, uh, worked for me as a consultant in Washington, D.C. until recently. He's 70 years old. 
And uh, he said that they could do what they did in Guatemala because no one knew and no one cared. Uh, in Chile in 73, uh, maybe tens of thousands of Americans understood what we were doing, but it wasn't enough to, to affect that policy and, and, uh, and uh, influence it. Today, uh, millions of Americans understand what their government is doing and are concerned about it and, and are affecting that process. And I think that, that nations learn lessons slowly, but I think that like Great Britain, in the declining years of its, uh, of its empire, uh, was slow to recognize its uh, uh, zenith. I think that the United States may be facing a similar kind of problem where economic threats are probably more uh, of a jeopardy to our national security than our military ones. And we've been ignoring the $300 billion deficit of Latin America uh, totally focusing only on uh, a perceived ideological problem in Nicaragua, much to the dismay of our allies in the region. Dan Goldie, member. Uh, assuming that in this election that will take place this fall, the president is inaugurated in January, who will take a very different approach to the problems, what would you see as the kind of program that would deal effectively with the economic and the poverty and the social issues down there, which are basic to the kind of problem we see? And in that connection, could you tell us what happened to the Caribbean Economic Initiative, which was launched with such great fanfare a few years ago, but about which we hear nothing now? I think it's a, it's a very important question because obviously the, the, the future of our relations with the region uh, hinges on the economics and development is crucial to that process. And the Caribbean Basin uh, uh, initiative has, uh, has, has very quietly crashed. It has had very little uh, effect and in fact uh, in places like Jamaica it's had a, a negative effect. I think that there are a number of uh, private think tanks in association with universities at the moment that are formulating a Marshall-like plan for the region that would have to be an adjunct for the IRIUS plan to, uh, to be successful. Uh, to transition some of the massive amounts of military aid that we've spent uh, into uh, economic aid and to find ways, unlike the Alliance for Progress, where these are not trickle-down theories of development, but we can find middle and low-level institutions in which to infuse that, that aid. The initiative that's being developed uh, is for 1989. Uh, it depends on, a, on uh, another administration, be it Republican or Democratic. It's a private initiative that in, uh, uh, enjoins the, the private sector to get involved and doesn't depend on uh, totally government funding. Um, and I think that this uh, initiative will probably be unveiled in December after the elections. Uh, I think it's a beginning. Some of the best economic minds in Latin America, not the ones that are tied up with drug trade or, or, or running bankrupt uh, economies, but some of the mid-level thinkers have been involved in the planning of it. They're coming to the United States on a regular basis because I think like the Alliance for Progress attempted, it's to have the Latin Americans help us define how to meet these problems head on, not for us to dictate to them how it should be met. Um, I think that, uh, that we will uh, hear more about this in, uh, in the latter part of this year, and I think that uh, it, is, uh, it is crucial for the success of the, of the ARIAS plan because without uh, development, uh, the, uh, the turmoil will only, will only continue and lead to more strife. Greg Kafuri, I'm a member. There is an interesting parallel in uh, Kennan's quote about how we're 6% of the people and have control of half the wealth, and the situation that you find in these third world countries where you have tiny percentages of the population that controls vast percentages of the wealth. Don't you think that in countries like Nicaragua, like El Salvador, like Guatemala, the redistribution of wealth is going to have to come about through governments which use a great deal of coercion. And uh, secondly, 
don't you think that the United States, or do you think that the United States uh, will be able to adjust to a non-interventionist policy to allow this process to happen in the third world uh, without an impairment of our, sta of our uh, standard of living? In other words, was Kennan right? Well, I think that it doesn't necessarily require the American citizens giving up uh, any portion of their private wealth for uh, a redistribution to occur. And I think that there's some hopeful signs that it might have been harder for a Democratic administration to undertake than it was for a Republican. But the fact that we distanced ourselves, if only at the last moment from Marcos, and a few weeks earlier for Duvalier, and now it's revealed uh, publicly that we had a plan to, to ease Noriega out of office uh, as much as a year ago, are hopeful signs in understanding that the maintaining of these economic elites is what then leads to the kind of strife that, that we, we've seen. In El Salvador, up until 1984, we had put $1.4 billion into that country, and their own Ministry of Finance indicates $1.1 billion left to Miami and Swiss bank accounts. In other words, the oligarchs were getting their money out of the country while our money was keeping the economy afloat. And I think that country is a perfect example of the unwillingness uh, of the economic elites uh, to let go of any control of the, of the they own 80% of the arable land of that country, 2% of the population. Uh, and I think that's what 1954 was about in Guatemala. Half the arable land of Guatemala at that time was owned by United Fruit. Arbenz was elected on a platform of expropriating and redistributing that land with compensation to United Fruit, but that was seen as a threat to U.S. security and portrayed as a, as a, as a communist uh, scheme. Allende in Chile in 1973, although uh, uh, economically uh, not a great manager, was determined to redistribute the wealth and power controlled by IT&T and Kindecott Copper in that country, uh, and our destabilization scheme uh, certainly helped ease him uh, out, of, out of power. But again, uh, those are going to be problems, and we're going to have to send strong signals to affect those kinds of change. And the fact that we've been finally willing to send them uh, to people like Marcos and Duvalier, even though they're the most heinous of the, uh, uh, of the, of the group, uh, is an indication that we may be willing to take some of the steps to use our economic muscle uh, in a positive kind of intervention rather than a negative one because redistribution of wealth is the primary problems of many of those societies. We have several other questions, but we're just about out of time. Let me ask you to comment quickly, Dr. Clements, if you would, on this question. What changes in education and health have the Sandinistas initiated? I mentioned that the Contras had uh, made primary targets of the agricultural sector, the, the education sector, and the health sector because these were the sectors that the Sandinistas had achieved a great deal in a short amount of time. Um, as I said, we've just published a, a booklet about that that pointed out in 1982 the World Health Organization gave Nicaragua its award for the third world country having made the most strides in health. They eliminated polio completely. Uh, they reduced the incidence of uh, uh, infant mortality from about 128 per thousand down to 82, a remarkable stride. They almost eliminated uh, uh, measles, which is a killer in third world countries, and made great strides in reducing malaria, making health care available uh, for the whole public and emphasizing prevention and public health uh, as a means of improving the health of the population as a whole. Uh, in education, a literacy campaign undertook a similar effort and the national literacy went from uh, just above 50 percent to the low 90th percentile, uh, a remarkable achievement that was recognized by, by UNICEF uh, in the early years from 1979 to, to 1982 of their, of their revolution. And those were the targets as the Contra uh, strategy was to undermine what has made the Sandinistas popular, and it's, it's tragic. I might mention that for any member that's interested in this book, Health is a Human Right, which we've published, it includes a study by the Harvard School of Public Health and uh, testimonies from physicians and nurses that USC has sponsored down there. I'd be happy to provide it to, to any of the membership that's uh, interested in having a copy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clements.
this is an area of great concern to all of us, and we've received information today that we all badly need. We thank you for that, Dr. Clements. I remind you again to watch for the motion picture based on uh, Dr. Clements' career uh, on cable television next week. We are adjourned. Sure,